There's a tiny island surrounded by the stunning clear Red Sea and a bustling underwater world. Zabargad, also known as St. John's Island, has no trees and consists mostly of peridotite, which is rich in peridot. And before you Google it, peridotite is a gemstone that has the nickname the Evening Emerald because of its sparkling green hue. Some historians believe Cleopatra herself loved peridots, and that lady could afford any jewels in the world. Geologists believe peridot forms as a result of the spreading of the seafloor. When the Earth's crust decides to part ways, rocks from deep down get pushed up to the surface. That's exactly how our treasure island formed. The African and the Asiatic continental plates bumped into each other, and rocks in the lower crust went above sea level. Peridot also comes from meteorites that have crashed into Earth, but that's really rare. Its color ranges from a brown-green color to yellowish-green to pure green. Yellowish-green is the most common shade you'll see in jewelry. This color is possible thanks to a good amount of iron in the stone. The deposits of this beauty are spread all across the world, from Vietnam to Arizona and Hawaii, Tanzania, South Africa, Sri Lanka, and Norway. And then, of course, there's a Bargod. So, this place is geologically unique as it's an island built of uplifted mantle, and it's also the oldest and longest known source of peridots in the world. The first people came here for the gemstones many centuries ago. Famous Roman philosopher Pliny the Elder mentioned in his writings that pirates had discovered Zabargod's treasures in the year 500 before the current era. The beautiful green rocks made their way to Queen Bernice of the Roman Empire. They came from the ancient trading port Berenike on the edge of Egypt's eastern desert. When the city fell in the 6th century, all work stopped and the island with all its treasures stood alone for hundreds of years. In the 19th century, British explorers found the beautiful green island in the Red Sea and figured out it was the one described by Pliny the Elder a long time ago. Turkey did some mining here in the 20th century. Over just four years, they managed to collect over $2 million in peridots. They sent the gemstones to France for cutting. The work conditions on the island were nothing like a tropical fairy tale you could imagine. There was no drinking water for workers, so they had to install a gas-powered water condenser. Now, this territory belongs to the Elba National Park System. Most people come here to see the underwater beauties of the reefs. But if you look above the water, you can still see some beautiful sparkling peridots. If Christmas Island in Australia is on your travel list, plan the trip wisely. If you end up there in October or November when the wet season begins, you won't be able to enjoy a walk around. Red crabs cover the whole island like a blanket. And it's not one of those fluffy blankets you want to wrap yourself into. Over 100 million crabs are on a mission to reach the shore alive, marking a crucial phase in their life cycle. For the majority of the year, these red crabs reside in burrows and rock crevices. They have fruits, berries, fallen leaves, and various organic matter to keep them going. But when the dry season is over and the moon is in a specific phase, they know it's time to go. When they reach the coast of the Indian Ocean after several days of migration, they create deep burrows where females will eventually hatch their eggs. Once the burrows are ready, the male crabs return to the rainforests and the females stay at the beach for at least 12 days to keep the family going. The new parents are so smart, they follow the moon to pick the perfect moment with a milder tide to carry their eggs to the water. Once they hatch, the crabs bring their new family members back inland. There, they wait for the rainy season again to keep the circle of life going. To safeguard this magic, authorities close road in areas where crab migration takes place. Japan has a brand new addition to its archipelago. The world's newest landmass literally popped up in November 2023. This unnamed island is just over 300 feet in diameter. It's made of pumice and tuff left by an undersea volcano that kicked off its eruptions in October. The volcanic hustle has quieted down since then and the waves are eroding chunks of the newly found land. Without lava flows to create a sturdy protective crust over the soft volcanic debris, the future of this freshly formed island is unstable. 
Similar islands had popped up before but were short-lived and vanished once volcanic activity ceased. An island born in 2021 the same way is still visible today though, so the newborn island might have some life prospects. If not, we're likely to see more territories like this. Japan is super rich in active volcanoes on land, with over a hundred in its collection. If you make friends with the Uros people living in the Lake Titicaca area and ask them for their address to send a postcard, they will have a hard time answering. Their ancestors from more than 500 years ago came up with a brilliant invention to protect themselves from the Incas. They built islands from totora roots and reeds that could be moved away from danger deep into the lake. Totora plants help the local community a lot since it's water resistant and is used for all sorts of things, from building boats to roofs and mattresses. The islets are even edible, and the flowers of the plant they're made of are used for tea. So there are around 120 islets still preserved, and over a thousand people can live on them. From two to six families share one islet home. Since there's no need to run away from the Incas anymore, they need to make sure the islets stay in one place. Every 15 to 20 days, the reeds forming the islets decay and need to be replaced. To prevent constant drifting, locals use eucalyptus rods as anchors, firmly securing the islets. Despite their small size, these islets have two spoken languages. The residents craft their fabric and create stunning outfits. Solar panels provide sufficient power for them to have light and even TVs. The main islet has a radio station, and the locals have embraced tourism. You can make a reservation online and experience the floating life yourself. Some islands pop out of nowhere, and others disappear without a trace. One of the most famous so-called phantom islands is High Brazil off the coast of Ireland. Before you ask, no, it doesn't have anything to do with Brazil. High is a variation of I, which means island, and Brazil comes from the root Brez meaning mighty, great, beautiful in Irish, and it gave the name to one of the local deities. This tiny mist-covered island was first mapped in 1325, but later attempts to pinpoint its exact location didn't come to one result. So, legend has it that the island appears only once in seven years, and even those who claim to have seen it say they had just sailed right through it without bumping into any land. Captain John Nisbet shared the story of how he had not only spotted High Brazil, but got stranded on it with his crew. According to him, the island boasted a castle and was mostly uninhabited. There was even an encounter with an ancient grave gentleman, who shared the island's ancient history over a lavish feast. In the late 15th century, a series of expeditions set sail from Bristol to find the famous island. All attempts failed, and High Brazil disappeared from the maps in 1865. We might never find out if it was there in the first place, but it's a beautiful story anyway. No one expected such a strong storm. It's too dangerous to sail back to the land because of high waves and winds. But suddenly, you notice a small green island nearby. You and your friend are about 25 miles off the coast of Brazil. You were fishing and didn't notice black clouds obscuring the blue sky. You're approaching the unknown island and see a Coast Guard boat behind you. People from there are screaming something to you, but you can't make out the words because of the thunder. They tell us we should stay away from that island, your friend says. Despite the warning, you still sail since there's no other way out. Around the island, you notice sharp rocks sticking out of the water like knives in the dark. Now you realize what the Coast Guard warned about, but it's too late! Your boat hits a rock! The bottom is pierced. You start to sink. The rain and wind are getting stronger. Both of you fall overboard. Then darkness comes. You wake up in the morning because of the scorching sun and a dry mouth. Your friend and the wrecked boat are lying nearby. Apparently, you'll have to wait for rescuers to get out here. Now, in the light of day, you can see how dangerous the island's coast is. It's surrounded by rocks, and you're lucky you've survived. Getting out of here will be difficult. Together with your companion, you decide to look for coconuts and bananas. Your friend goes to the wreckage and pulls out a bag of medicine. 
Then, both of you leave the sandy beach and enter the dense jungle. A couple of steps later, you hear a strange hiss. You see your friend. His eyes are filled with horror. Goosebumps run down your back. You feel something alive crawling under your feet, and there's a lot of it. You look down and notice slithering snakes. There are dozens of them. They wrap around your legs, get into trees. They're everywhere. Don't move, your friend says. I think I know where we are. You want to ask him a question, but fear takes away your voice. He reads your face and answers the question. We're in one of the most dangerous places on Earth, the Brazilian Snake Island. These are not just some ordinary snakes. This is the Golden Lancehead, one of the most venomous reptiles in the world. You can find them nowhere else on the planet except for this land. They evolved here naturally, without other snake species intervention. That made their venom five times stronger than the venom of ordinary vipers. They're practically the only owners of this island. Nowhere else in the world will you find such a concentration of creeping reptiles on such a small piece of land. And now, they're glad that two big lunch meals have arrived. There's little chance of survival, but you're gonna try. The first thing you need to do is get out of your stupor and find a thick stick. This is your best tool right now. If you encounter a venomous snake, the best you can do is retreat slowly. But this time, there are too many of them. They're aggressive and hungry. Together with your friend, you fight off the snakes with a stick. But there's more and more of them coming. One of them falls on your shoulder from a tree and bites your neck. The poison instantly enters your bloodstream and affects your muscles. It feels like your body is melting. It becomes difficult to move and your neck swells. Your friend grabs you and carries you deep into the jungle. Here, among the trees, you notice an old lighthouse. Yeah, this building really stands out here. Once a year, the Coast Guard visits it. Your friend breaks down the door and puts you on the floor. You're afraid you won't be able to survive the bite. Fortunately, your friend is a doctor. He injects the necessary medicine and saves your life. You have a few minutes to rest before more danger arises. Your friend tells you that the unique snakes appeared here thousands of years ago. This island was part of Brazil for a long time. Then, massive floods separated it from the continent. This part of the land was cut off from the whole world, which helped the formation of a unique ecosystem inside. Vipers that lived here evolved into golden lanceheads. They quickly became the main masters of the island and destroyed all the other animals. But how did they manage to survive without food, cut off from the whole world? They did it thanks to nature and evolution. This island is a transit point for many birds. They stop here to rest during long flights. These birds become dinner for the snakes. Previously, a snake bite almost didn't harm the birds. They were frightened and flew away, leaving the snake without food. But over years of evolution, the island's owners have developed such a potent poison that one bite was enough for a bird to never take off again. There's also a legend that a pirate hid treasures here a long time ago. And, so that no one would ever find it, he brought snakes to guard his gold. Of course, there's no chest with coins here, but the island is attractive for modern pirates, even today. Golden lancehead snakes are an expensive commodity, so bad people often visit this place to hunt the reptiles. That's why the Coast Guard is always on duty around the island. People are forbidden to visit this place. And even if someone manages to get past the guards, they will have to face the rocks. Only biologists and scientists have permission to study the local fauna. A necessary condition for a visit is a doctor's presence in the team, so they can save people from the snake's poison. So we have pirates and hordes of poisonous snakes, but there's something else that makes the island even worse. At this moment, you hear rustling all over the building. Thousands of little paws are tapping on the walls and floor. You look around and see lots of giant cockroaches. Some of them are half the size of your palm. They crawl under your clothes. You and your friends scream in fear and run out of the lighthouse. Quickly, you reach the shore and fall into the water. It seems that not a single cockroach is left under your shirt. But that's not all. You hear a strange buzzing sound. You look around and see a dark cloud of flying beetles forming in the sky. It's locusts! Thousands of flying insects are heading in your direction. 
To avoid a collision, you dive under the water and wait for the cloud to pass by. You go up to the surface and move to the shore. Fortunately, there are almost no snakes here. You and your friend are afraid to approach the jungle and wait for several hours until rescuers arrive. You're nervously painting a pattern on the sand and make a promise that you'll never revisit this place. Finally, you see the lifeguard boat. You're trying to tell them you got here by accident. They believe you and evacuate you from the island. While you're sailing away, you think about what would happen if many poisonous snakes appeared in a village or a small town. It's difficult to imagine what kind of problems people would face. But in fact, there's no need to imagine anything. There is a place on the planet where locals live next to poisonous cobras. But it doesn't create any chaos. A human can live in peace and harmony with reptiles in that village. Welcome to Shetpal Village in India. This place has a population of about 2,600, and it's located in the jungle. It's hot here. Locals are friendly and responsive. If you go into one of the houses, you'll see something <gasps> that seems impossible. The King Cobra, whose venom is one of the most dangerous in the world, calmly crawls around furniture and eats eggs and meat that people give. There's even a special corner for the reptile to relax from the scorching sun drink water, and have a snack. People are happy about the cobra, as if it was a pet. In the village, cobras are everywhere. They come into houses and schools, crawl through the streets, and keep company during dinner. The locals consider them full-fledged residents. They adore them. The snakes are also used to people and don't see them as dangerous. The coolest thing is there has never been a tragic case in the village because of a poisonous bite. There's no other place in the world where cobras live in such harmony with people. The Moai statues have been standing tall and proud for hundreds of years. Once, people put an enormous effort into carving these grand sculptures. And then, they just suddenly stopped making them. But why? Let's figure out this mystery. Easter Island, located 2,500 miles east of Tahiti, has an area of 63 square miles. To this day, it's one of the most isolated islands in the world. Once, it was covered with forests, filled with different trees and ferns. But when the first humans came to the island around 400 CE, the forest slowly began to disappear. And starting from 1250 CE, Moai statues began appearing all over the place. People made them from different types of rock compressed volcanic ash, basalt, trachyte, and red scoria. As it's a volcanic island, these were all the ingredients the creators of the statues had to use. And once the builders completed their work, they covered the statues with pumice. The faces of the statues are different, but they all have distinct expressions with heavy brows and large noses. Their arms are carved into the body. Some have hats on top of their heads. There are nearly 900 statues all over the island. They differ in size. The average height is 13 feet tall, and the largest ones reach 33 feet in height and weigh up to 82 tons. Because the statues have so many different faces, there are theories that they represent and honor ancestors, chiefs, and other important people who lived on the island. But without any clear evidence, it's almost impossible to figure out the true purpose of the Moai. Once, they stood beautifully along the coast, watching over people in settlements. And their backs faced toward the spirit world of the sea. When Europeans first discovered the Moai statues in the 1700s, many of them had already toppled over. And the construction of statues had stopped way earlier than that. Huge amounts of effort were put into making these things. Expert craftspeople spent a great deal of time slowly carving the statues with basic picks. A team of up to six people would work hard for an entire year to make just one statue. Then they often had to transport it to its special place on the island, as far as 11 miles. With the help of carbon dating, experts have managed to figure out that the statue started to appear in 1250 CE. And then, suddenly, in 1500 CE or so, the process just stopped. The creators of the statue just left their stone chisels where they were last used, and only a quarter of all the statues were actually placed where they were supposed to be. Half of them still remained in the quarry, while others were left on the ground mid-transit. Something happened on the island, and it caused everyone to just lose interest in the statues. 
There are many theories around why it could happen, and they mostly relate to deforestation. Islanders may have used wood to move the statues across the island. They possibly did this with the help of sleds and ropes, or even used logs to roll the statues or canoes to float them. The wood started to deplete eventually. Trees on the island took very long to grow, and rats ate most seeds. People had many uses for wood, and they needed it not only for practical things, but also to create other statues. Another reason why the inhabitants of the island could have stopped building the statues might be that they were busy with other projects. Specialized rock gardens were becoming more common with a growing population. They were great for the soil, keeping it warm and fertilizing it at the same time. Islanders spent much time and effort making these rock gardens, and there simply wasn't enough time to focus on building and moving the statues. Another theory suggests that what people believed in changed over time. Supposedly, the islands once saw the statues as a connection to their ancestors. After some time, though, rituals depicting a show of strength and endurance became more widespread. And with these rituals, islanders started to carve images related to seabirds. Seabirds became the main animal on the island. People started to believe that their ancestors looked over them through birds instead of the statues, so there was no longer a reason to build the moai. Anyway, these theories might be true. But the main problem was that the small island couldn't support a growing population. What was once a lush land covered in forests quickly became a barren landscape. For the first few centuries, people relied on forest resources. But agriculture became more important sometime after 1550, when forests disappeared. Tribes that once worked together to build the fantastic monoliths focused on competing against one another instead. During this struggle for land and resources, the Moai statues were toppled over because people wanted to reduce their significance. Over the following centuries, all the statues were pushed over, but not all of them deliberately. Many fell naturally after being neglected for so long. Some even ended up in the ocean water surrounding the island. And there they sat for a while. But there was some good news for these statues. They were re-erected, providing a great experience for visitors from all over the world. If you make a journey all the way to this isolated island, the first question you'll probably ask will not be how the statues were made or how they were moved. It will be, how on earth did anyone even make it here in the first place? It was one of the most amazing feats ever. The Polynesians sure did some pretty extraordinary things. From as early as 1500 BCE, these boat-faring people began to explore their world. They used the most advanced marine inventions of their time. They sailed across the ocean in catamarans and outrigger boats, starting in Southeast Asia and inhabiting many more places throughout the Pacific. They lived as far north as Hawaii in 900 BCE and all the way to the south in New Zealand by 1200 BCE. And the farthest journey to the east was, of course, Easter Island. In only a few hundred years, these early sailors inhabited an area of thousands of square miles. They simply memorized where they had already been and, this way, managed to navigate the ocean. They used a wide range of techniques. They watched the sun as it rose and set during the day. Stars helped them at night. If it was overcast and sailors couldn't figure out direction visually, they used other brilliant methods. They watched the movements of ocean currents and wave patterns and paid attention to bioluminescence in the water. These patterns helped them find where specific islands were located. These seafarers even understood how islands and atolls in the distance caused air and sea interference patterns. Birds provided them with certain signs, too. Some of them migrated long distances from one island to another, which gave travelers some kind of a visual connection for their route. Other types of birds had specific feeding times. Sailors knew when and where they hunted and directed their boats depending on where these birds fed. Vikings certainly get way too much credit for their seafaring abilities. Where they used a sun compass, the early Polynesians relied purely on the knowledge of how nature itself could guide them. Their skills were so advanced that in 1769, Captain James Cook, an English explorer, even hired a Polynesian navigator because of his extensive knowledge of the seas. But even more surprising was the fact that he drew a map from memory. It covered an area that was 2,000 miles wide. 
In this region, there were 130 islands, and the navigator knew 74 of those islands by name. At the beginning of their voyage, Captain Cook often disregarded the navigator's advice. But toward the end of their journey, he was very impressed. He also recognized the Polynesians as possibly the most widespread nation on Earth. The Easter Island giant heads are so popular that they even have their own emoji. Their true meaning has been a mystery for hundreds of years. But it looks like we at least know how they were built and transported to their permanent location. The Moai statues consist of three parts. A large yellow body, a red hat or top knot, and white inset eyes with a coral iris. Around 1,000 of them were created. The main bodies of most of the statues were made out of volcanic tuff from a local quarry in what used to be a volcano. The material is easy to carve, but not so easy to transport. That's probably why researchers found over 300 unfinished moai back in the quarry. The rest of them stand in various locations, facing the villages as if watching over the locals. So, it looks like the statues were carved lying on their backs. Then, their creators detached them from the rock, moved them down slope, and set them in a vertical position to finish the work. Once it was done, it was time to get the statue to its platform. Now, if you've ever moved houses, you know how physically hard it is. So, imagine having to move a statue that is about half as heavy as a house without a car or any modern equipment for a distance of 3 miles. The locals must have invented some original way of doing it, and scientists tried to recreate it to guess what it was. They tried pulling Moai replicas on wooden sleds. They thought someone could have used palm trees for that purpose, but this theory has been debunked. The most successful experiment so far was wielding ropes to rock the statue down the road in a standing position. This method sounds real because the local Rapa Noai legends mentioned that the Moai walked from the quarry. And, of course, they needed a good road to get there. In the early 20th century, researcher Catherine Rutledge identified an 800-year-old road network on the island. It was a bunch of pathways around 15 feet wide going from the quarry. She thought that those roads were ceremonial and not built just for the statues. She wasn't a famous scientist back then, so others mostly ignored the theory. Several decades later, famous Norwegian adventurer and archaeologist Thor Heyerdahl published his theory. He mentioned that the roads were built exclusively to transport the Moai and some of the statues were dropped along the roads for some reason. But in 2010, researchers found that the statues weren't randomly dropped. They actually reached their final destinations as they were all set on hidden platforms. Plus, the road floor was U-shaped, so pulling massive statues along them wouldn't be easy. You can still find roughly 15.5 miles of these roads on the island and see them from satellite images. And it looks like Catherine Rutledge was right about them. The roads were probably built for pilgrims to a sacred volcano, and the Moai standing by them were sort of signposts. Halfway across the world in southern England lies another mystery made of stone. A massive sound illusion, a symbol of unity, a burial ground, or more. Scientists are still debating the purpose of Stonehenge. It took Neolithic builders around 1,500 years to construct this beauty made of roughly 100 stones standing upright in a circle. Millions of tourists come to see it every year, and heritage protectors were worried about the modern road snaking close to the landmark. That modern road is now sunk into the ground below the grass level. And even though archaeologists assumed they could find an older road under it, they didn't have any high hopes. But when they took off a layer of asphalt, they noticed two parallel ditches that were nearly perpendicular to the road. The ditches connected the shortened sections of the avenue, 
That's what the archaeologists call the ancient pathway leading up to Stonehenge. It proves that the ancient people used to visit the monument for their purposes and probably some ceremonies. Another interesting find during a dry summer was three dry patch marks within the stone circle. It looks like they were left there by three massive boulders. So Stonehenge could have been a full circle once. In 2021, archaeologists found a Roman road submerged in the Venetian lagoon. The fact that it runs there on the bottom for nearly 4,000 feet is proof that the Romans were here before sea levels rose and flooded the area. It supports the theory that there was an important settlement here centuries before Venice was founded at the spot in the 5th century CE. The ancient Romans were great at many things, and one of them was building roads. And it looks like they weren't afraid to work on the trickiest terrain. Scans have shown that the ancient road was built right on the beach, and it requires some serious skills. Imagine a village from over a thousand years ago frozen in time. There's still half-eaten food on the tables and personal things left in a rush. It's all preserved so well because it's covered by volcanic ash. Researchers found this village in 2011 in modern-day El Salvador. They believe there was a mass celebration in a Maya village called Serin over 1400 years ago. The whole village was there, preparing the main temple for a ritual when a nearby volcano erupted. The 200-plus residents had no time to rush back to their homes. To save their lives, they had to flee the plaza and run south on a raised road called Sakbe. They managed to escape from the plumes of volcanic ash. In addition to being a superhero and saving all the people, the road had another cool feature. All Sakbe roads had an outer layer of stones. But this one was made of ash. Ironic, isn't it? It proves that the Maya people didn't only use stones to build their roads. Archaeologists discovered several coins in Jerusalem when they were excavating an old street. When they saw the minting dates, they realized the road was built when Pontius Pilate was the Roman governor of Judea. Since he was the local ruler, it's almost clear that he gave the order to build the road. The pilgrims most likely used this road to reach the Temple Mount for worship. The pathway, which was laid with over 10,000 tons of limestone, was almost as broad as a London bus is long. It had been there for 2,000 years. It's not common that you find such a luxurious road, and it's not clear why a Roman governor would spend so much money on the road. It was probably his attempt to make the city's population like him. Plus, it was a great way to show he had both money and influence. The Old North Trail is an ancient highway that the inhabitants of North America used for 10,000 years, first on foot, then with dogs, and finally with horses. The first travelers moved around the continent down its paths for thousands of miles long before the first Europeans arrived, and even during the last ice age. They used it to carry trade goods, visit relatives, find a mate, or just explore. Researchers keep finding evidence that the stories and legends of the Blackfoot Indians about this trail are real. And it could be even the road that served one of the most massive human migrations, the people who crossed from Asia on the Bering Land Bridge about 15,000 years ago and settled in North America might have used the ice-free corridor along the Rockies, which later became a part of the trail. The Nakasendo Highway was built in the 17th century during the Edo period of Japanese history to link Kyoto and Tokyo. The 310-mile-long road runs across mountain ranges and down onto the plain. It was one of the five main roads used by the feudal lords and their families to travel to the capital. There were 69 post stations on the route where travelers could stay overnight. The road was built for horses and pedestrians, as the Japanese didn't use carts. You can still walk parts of the route. 
you're going to Ilha de Quiamada Grande, one of the most dangerous islands in the world. There, you find yourself among rainforests, huge rocks, and grasslands. The place is home to birds, locusts, and giant cockroaches. But there's one more animal, and because of it, the island got its notorious reputation. Snakes live there, and a lot of them. So many that the place is also known as Snake Island. Will you survive there? Located just 20 miles away from the coast of Brazil, the island has an area of 43 hectares, or over 100 acres. It probably got cut off from the mainland after the last ice age. The snakes were also separated from most other animal species. They didn't have competitors and had an unlimited source of food. In such a small area, there are up to 4,000 snakes. That's one snake for every 10 square feet. It would be a difficult feat not to come across a snake on this island. Not only is this snake, the golden lancehead, one of the most numerous on the island, but it's also a highly venomous pit viper species. And it's also one of the most venomous in all of Latin America. Its venom is so potent due to the isolation of the species, with only birds sharing the land with them. To catch these birds, the snake's venom needed to become extra strong. And indeed, since they got separated from their distant relatives, their venom has become up to five times more powerful. Most of the time, these snakes hide in the trees or amongst leaves on the ground. If you find yourself stranded here, you'll want to keep yourself a safe distance away. Snakes mainly use their sense of smell and rely on vibrations. If you get too close to one, either stand still or slowly walk away. If you make too many vibrations, this will make them feel threatened, causing them to strike. If you spot them a safe distance away, or if you're walking toward tall grass, stamp your feet a couple of times. This will notify snakes of your presence. They won't risk taking down prey larger than they are and will likely slither away. Carrying a stick is always a good idea, just in case you happen to come across a snake accidentally. This way, you'll have an extension of your arm that cannot be bitten. This simple thing might save your life. A stick with a V-shape on the end will give you even more advantage. Even if a snake starts acting aggressively, holding it down will stop it in its tracks. But whatever happens, don't try to pick it up. Okay, but what if you get bitten? The chances are pretty high on this island, of course. First of all, don't try to get the venom out on your own. Make sure you call emergency services immediately. And once help is on the way, apply a wide bandage. A piece of clothing will do if you don't have anything else. Don't try to chase the snake trying to identify the species. Emergency services know how to figure out what venom it is. Now, just keep calm and wait for help. You might be wondering who you can call on this abandoned island. Well, since it's strictly prohibited to visit this place, there are signs advising to stay away all over the island, along with a number you can call if you run into trouble. Let's say you've successfully avoided getting bitten. The next thing to consider is what you can eat there. Snake Island was previously known as Ilha de Quiamada Grande, where Quiamada is Portuguese for forest being lit up or forest fire. The reason for that was the fact that the entire island was deliberately set on fire to make room for a banana plantation. Unfortunately, the banana business didn't turn out to be a success, probably because farmers got sick and tired of snakes. But some banana trees still thrive today, and they can provide you with some much needed nutrients. You'll also want some protein in your diet throughout your stay. Luckily, along with the snakes trapped on the island, there are also cockroaches. These giant prehistoric looking roaches come out at night to feed on plants. Get that barbecue started and enjoy the rare delicacy this island provides. A great way to survive on the island is to avoid it altogether. If by chance you happen to be sailing past, keep in mind that this place was once connected to the mainland. Rocks beneath the waves are very likely to damage the bottom of your boat if you get too close. Make sure you keep an appropriate distance when traveling past. Sure, this island is intriguing, but please remember that no matter how close you get to it, you won't be able to see snakes from the boat. You can only see these creatures if you get close enough, which you really shouldn't do. And it's not only reptiles that make this location dangerous. Pirates visit the island quite often. 
Not the sea shanty singing peg-legged arbor pirates. But bio-pirates, who come there to capture the very thing that makes it so dangerous. They come there for snakes, to catch them and sell them illegally. Since the island got cut off around 11,000 years ago, the golden lancehead has evolved within its own unique habitat. So, although there are many reptiles on this island, they're still an endangered species. Due to their limited numbers, their value is very high, reaching up to $30,000 on illegal markets, which gives biopirates the motivation to catch them. I can think of better ways to make a living. Anyway, let's say you've got all the resources necessary to survive in one of the most dangerous places on Earth. Do you think you would manage this feat? Perhaps you think it's impossible. You'd be surprised at how possible it can be, if you know what you're doing. It turns out many have visited this scary place before. Research teams often come there. They study the golden lancehead snake, its environment, and its food sources for conservation purposes. But scientists always make sure there's a doctor on the team. There's also a lighthouse on Snake Island. It had been operated by people until the 1920s. Then it became automated. One guess why. Brazilian authorities visit the lighthouse once a year to make sure it's still functional. Locals on the mainland know the reputation of the island, so the stories of people going missing are minimal. But one group of fishers once got too close to the island. As they were sailing along their normal route, they accidentally neared the shore. Their boat hit a rock under the waves and began filling with water. As the boat was quickly sinking, the men had only two options to try to survive in the rough sea or swim to the shores of Snake Island. It was a hard choice to make. After all, they had heard the stories, and it wasn't just about snakes. Rumor had it that the island was cursed. Regardless of the stories, the fishers chose to take their chances with Snake Island. After making it to the shore, they tried to be careful. Their knowledge of the island could help them survive. Most importantly, they knew to avoid the rainforest at all costs. As the men got hungry, they carefully walked along the edge of the forest, warily collecting bananas. They were mostly sitting, waiting, and conserving their energy. They could only drink water when it rained. It was just enough to sustain them. They slept on the beach, unprotected from the elements and weather. And all the time, they were so close to the comfort of the lighthouse or caves. They were probably overly cautious, but it was either enduring some discomfort or risking their lives for a dry bed. They didn't yield to the temptation. They managed to survive for three days without being bitten by a snake. After that, a passing boat finally rescued them. So, now you know, anything is possible. <laughs>